back in the Roman Empire, it was it was basically stated in ancient Rome that there were only two things on the earth, uh, land and water. And therefore, there were two kinds of law to be established on this earth, the law of the land and the law of water. Brilliant. That's all there is is land and water. So the law of the land, and people have heard that term, the law of the land, but you don't realize when you use the term law of the land, it's to differentiate between the law of the land as opposed to the law of the sea, the law of the ocean. That's why you use that term law of the land, because there's another law that it dominates the earth. It's called the law of the ocean, the law of the sea. The law of the land is obviously the law of the people who live on a particular piece of land. As, as many countries as there are, or as many cities as there are, that's how many laws of the land there is, because the, the law of the land is different in South Africa than it is in, in, in America. You can do things in China you cannot do in, in Egypt. You can do things in America you can't do in Australia because of the law of the land. The land is where the people live, so it's the law of the custom of the people who live on that particular piece of land. They have decided for themselves what their, what their customs will be. And when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So if you're going to go to Australia, you're going to go to South Africa, you're going to go to Egypt, you better learn what they can do and what they can't do. And if you don't like it, then you go back home where you can do what you want to do. But if you're in somebody else's country, you have to abide by their custom, the law of the land. Now, there is another law called the law of the sea, the law of the ocean. That is the banking law, because you can get a credit card in America and go to China and live pretty well and go vacation. Or you can get a credit card in, in Africa, in South Africa, and go to China on vacation and eat very well and live very well and go on a vacation. Why? Because it doesn't have anything to do with the custom of the people. We're talking money, period. It's just money. One law of the sea, water. So we say in America, money goes through your hands like water. No, money is water. Maritime Admiralty Law of England. The law of the sea is the law of banking. Banking law is referred to as the law of the sea. Therefore, let me explain to you. When a ship pulls into a harbor... Uh, we may have talked about this before, but it's important, so we need to hear it again. When a ship pulls into a harbor, first of all, you need to understand, according to international law, all ships are female. There is no such a thing as a male ship. All ships, by law, are female. That's why you will hear captains say, she's a good ship, and she's been seaworthy. She's this and she's that. All captains will refer to their ship, rocket ship, Sailing ship, doesn't matter what kind of airship, the captain calls his plane she. She's a good ship. She's seaworthy. Why? Because all ships by law are considered female. Reason why? Because all ships, any kind of a ship, delivers a product. And so the idea goes back into the ancient ancient world of, of Samaria, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, where the idea was the male manufactures, but the female produces the product. So therefore, we humans were manufactured, <laughs> but your mother was in labor and in the delivery room because she was building a product. And giving birth. And giving birth to a product. Therefore, when a ship pulls into a harbor, she parks at the dock. And where she parks at the dock, she ties off a rope onto the dock to hold her in her berth. Every item coming off of that ship from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world, doesn't <coughs> matter. We're talking business. We're talking banking. Any, any odd item on that ship coming off that ship must have something called a certificate of manifest because yesterday the ship wasn't here 
But today, we come to work, and there's a ship here from Japan or from China with $800 million worth of televisions or whatever. Uh, so it has manifested. $800 million worth of business is waiting for you at the dock. So therefore, every item coming off that ship, because it's manifested, must have a, what is called a certificate of manifest. Meaning every piece has coming off that ship has to be accounted for. How much does it weigh? What color was it? Does it have four doors, two doors, uh, air conditioning? No. What color? And so every item coming off the ship must have its own certificate of manifest. Why? Because it was brought in, she brought it in on water, and she is in her birth. So therefore, each item has to have what is called a birth certificate a certificate of manifest because she is sitting in her birth, B-E-R-T-H, a birth certificate. Therefore, when your mother gave birth to you, you came down her birth canal when her water broke. And therefore, you come out into the world as a maritime admiralty product. You came out of water down the canal. Therefore, you have to have a birth certificate. A certificate of manifest. Because last night you weren't here. This morning you're here. You manifested. So we got to know how much did you weigh? The hospital has to say, how much you weigh? What color was he? Did he have five fingers? Yes. <laughs> Why? Because you are considered a maritime admiralty product because she was in labor building you after your father manufactured. So once you begin to see how the commercial world works, you are nothing more than a product, a maritime admiralty product to be bought and sold, and therefore you have to have a birth certificate. Now, if you're taking one of those cars or TVs off of the ship and it drops down accidentally and breaks, you just lost money. You can't sell that one and make any money off of it. That's okay. Things like that happen, okay? And there's no problem with that in, in commerce. If you break something, it's so no problem. We take that off of our taxes. You know, there's, a, there's a loss. But you have to have a death certificate. And it's got to be signed by the dock. Why? Because that's what the damn thing fell and broke was at the dock. So the dock has to sign your birth certificate. And if you and if you die there, if you then he has to sign your death certificate. And we better make sure that the doctor is not lying about the death certificate. Because if you're lying about the death certificate, that you, that's prison time for a doctor. You don't want to lie. Did, did this person, was he, was he born dead? Yes. Prove it. Sign the paper and put your life on the line as a doctor and tell me that this person died at birth. And if we find out you're lying, because now he doesn't have to pay taxes, he doesn't have to be under government control, he's totally free because we don't know anything about him, and we find out you're lying, that's a felony for doctors. You go to jail for that. So therefore, doctors will have to sign your birth certificate. They have to sign your death certificate. Why? Because you are a maritime admiralty product. Your mother created you after you were manufactured. You were created, and she was in her labor. She was in labor in the delivery room because she was delivering you as a product. And that's why in your birth certificate on the bottom, on the right-hand bottom of the birth certificate where your mother or father signed, look at it. Look on the birth certificate. It doesn't say mother or father. It doesn't say parent. Where your mother and father signed, it says informant. Your mother and father was informing the corporation that the new television has just arrived in America, or a new car, a new automobile has just arrived that you didn't know about. So it's called an informant. Now, on the left side of your birth certificate, on the very bottom, you will see in small print the birth certificate is the property of the United States Commerce Department, Department of Commerce. Why? It's because your birth certificate is a commercial document. It's on actual banking. Uh, uh, paper. It's on banking paper. It's, con it's considered a stock, just like a stock certificate. So once you understand that you are 
That's why if you say uh, if your son's getting married or your daughter's getting married and she's marrying a very wealthy, you know, marrying into an extremely wealthy family, we say, well, you know, her, her fiancé she's marrying, he's of good stock. What do you mean? She's marrying a pig or marrying, or marrying a, 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 a horse? No, because all humans are considered stock. That's why if you're going to <laughs> – it's an incredible story about how we are maritime admiralty stock. We are like a stockyard. That's why all, uh, uh, you know, when we were growing up as kids in America, all houses and homes always had a yard, a front yard and a backyard. That's for your children to play in because it was a stockyard. And we still have stockyards today. That's why you, 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 you're creating a product for the commercial world that we live in. And so to protect the, the product, you put you give them a backyard to play in. So it's called a stockyard. So as soon as we're born, we are signed over to the United States or whatever country we live in. That's right. To our government. That's right. And they own your body. Are we signed over to the government or the country? Well, the government is the country. The government so the United the States country. of America, let's say? No, no, not to the United States of America. No, you're, you're signed over. When you're born here in this country, you're signed over to the United States, not the United States of America. There's a world of difference between the sun and the moon, between wet and dry, between up and down. Right. Opposites. Well, there's a big difference between United States or United States of America. Doesn't mean the same thing at all. United States of America is one thing. United States is totally different than the United States of America. That's the point that most people don't know anything about. So when you use the term United States, you're not talking about the United States of America, the 50 collective 50 states in the federal union. United States is not the 50 states. United States is a totally different entity completely. United no. States of America was founded in 1776 as a, as a constitutional republic, but that was done away with in 1871. We're no longer living in the United States of America. As of 1871, we are now living in something called the United States. This is why once a year, United States is considered not a country. United States of America is a country. It's a confederation of states, which we call the federal enclave, the federal states, the, the, the federal republic. But United States by itself is a company, it's a corporation, incorporated in 1871. A group of men got together after the Civil War and incorporated a company. In Delaware. Well, anybody, anyone can form a corporation. Anybody. So, so we could have done it. You can form a corporation. But if you form a corporation, then you are now under corporate law. You can't do certain things you could do as an individual. Now you're a corporation. But, of course, you get certain perks as a corporation, too. So there's some good and there's some bad. There's some up and there's some down. Now, you, you can, certain things you can do now as a corporation you couldn't do as a, as, by yourself. So corporation is a business. Well, anybody can form a corporation, but if you form a corporation, as I said, you're under corporate law, which means the first thing right off the bat is that you have to have, according to corporate law, a president of the corporation. You also have to have, according to the law, a vice president of the corporation, and you also have to have a secretary treasurer, at least those three things you have to have if you're going to have a corporation. So today we have a president, we have a vice president, we have a secretary treasurer of a corporation, a privately owned company, a corporation. And the corporation was incorporated in Delaware in 1871. As a privately owned company, 1871 Corporation Incorporated called United States Corporation has nothing to do whatsoever with the United States of America founded in, 18, in 1776. No, nothing to do with that at all. Privately owned corporation called United States Corporation <clears throat> Incorporated in 1871. It is now considered to be a corporation. Okay, now the point being is that According to the corporate law, anyone who would work for that corporation would be referred to as a citizen of that corporation. 
So today, if you walk into any business in America and you say, and they ask you in the bank or ask you in the, if you're applying for a job or anything, they ask you, are you a U.S. citizen? And you say, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen. You think what they're asking you, and a good attorney, a federal attorney, uh, would tell you in court, I'm going to ask you a question. But before you answer, think about what I'm going to ask you. The judge is listening, the court's listening, and this is all on the oath. I'm going to ask you a question. Be careful what you answer, the way you answer. Are you of your own volition, out of your own mouth, testifying that you are a U.S. citizen? Now, don't answer until you thought of, or think about it, because whatever you say, you can go to prison. So are you a U.S. citizen? And you say, well, what he's asking me is, am I lawful and legal to be in America? Yes, I'm a U.S. citizen. Good. Now you're going to jail because you no longer have any rights or protections on the law because a U.S. citizen is an is a employee of a privately owned company. You have no jurisdiction. There is no jurisdiction to protect you under the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. That's an American, not a U.S. citizen. So, therefore, there's a world of difference between a United States citizen and an American, United States of America. Because the United States of America, there was no U.S. citizenship. There was state citizenships. You were a citizen of the state in which you were living. That's why today, in 1871, after the Civil War, there was a privately owned company established called United States Corporation. And in that, they stipulated that anyone who would work for that corporation that was founded as a company, corporation, would be called a citizen. So today, if someone says, are you a U.S. citizen, and you say yes, what that means is that you have testified with your own, uh, out of your own mouth that you are an, an employee of a foreign corporation because it's foreign to any state because a United States corporation is not is not in any one of the states, so it's a foreign corporation. It's a place called Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. is not one of the states of America. So therefore, it's a foreign corporation. It's in a particular area called District of Columbia. District of Columbia is not a state. District of Columbia is an old as 10 miles square where the corporation operates from, but it's not in Maryland, it's not in Virginia, it's not in New York. It's a whole area that has its own flag, its own laws, its own jurisdiction, has nothing to do with the, with the 50 states of the union. And people don't realize that. They don't even have their own congressional seat. They don't have their own uh, senatorial seat. It's no. its own little uh, entity. Well, I got a lot of questions. First of all, who was the president, the first president of the uh, United the corporation? States Corporation? Oh, well, yeah. Google may... Uh, 1871 president. So the point being is that today, if you say that you are a U.S. citizen, <clears throat> what you are saying in law, in any courtroom, what you're saying is that you are an employee of a foreign corporation. Foreign corporations are perfectly fine in any state. You know, all kinds of countries have corporations in America. In California, we're filled with corporations from all over the world, corporations from, from automobile companies. Japan has corporations here. Africa has corporations. It's all right. That's fine. It's just business. As long as you remember that California's boss and you pay up front and you, and you have to tell California how much your corporation's buying and selling and you have to pay taxes from your corporation. But as long as you're, you're doing the business of a corporation, you can operate anywhere. As long as you pay your, pay your dues, as long as you pay your taxes. The corporation called United States is operating in a place called Washington, D.C., which is not a part of America. It has its own flag, the Washington, D.C. flag, which is, has its own jurisdiction, its own police department. It has nothing to do with the 50 states of the Union at all. So what it amounts to is, uh, you know, if you want to try and understand it this way, if you have a building, if you have a, uh, uh, what do they call them, condos, if you have a condominium building with condos and there's 50 condos in the building or 51, 51 units in the building, 
Well, 50 of those uh, units are sold to individuals. All right, the people who buy the those 50 uh, condos, they own their condo. They are not renting. They own it. Therefore, you have no jurisdiction over that condo. They own that condo. Therefore, the condo unit, all 50 people agree that somebody needs to be responsible for running this 50-unit building. Somebody's going to make sure the trash gets taken out, the pool gets clean, uh, to clean the yards, and if there's any breakdown or any problem with plumbing, somebody's got to be responsible in this building for the building. So we will all pay a little bit of money every month. Every condo pays a little bit, and we will appoint somebody to be in charge of maintenance for the building. And he's responsible to make sure that the trash is picked up, the pool is cleaned up, and if there's any problem with the electrical or, or plumbing or anything, he's responsible. And we all pay him, and he's responsible to make sure everything works right. So therefore, that would be Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is like a separate entity. It has nothing to do with all the condos. That's their business. They own it. He's, he's the property just, manager. He's just property manager. That's all he's doing. And therefore, he's paid by them to work for them. Well, what it turns out to be, after a while, the guy who is the property manager, who's being paid by those 50 different uh, condo owners, he begins to think of himself not as a property manager. He's God. He could do anything. He's in charge of the building. He's in charge of the pool. He's in charge of trash. That means he's actually God. He's in charge of everything. So now he can go in and walk into your condo anytime he wants because he's in charge. And he can tell you what paint, what color you can paint your walls. He can tell you how many people you can have over as guests. He can tell you anything he wants because he is God. He's been elected, and he's the boss of all bosses. Well, that's what's happened. Today, Washington, D.C. thinks it's God. It's based on the old Roman idea of the concept of, the, of Caesar being Augustus of Tiberius Caesar is God. And therefore, the Washington, D.C., as I said, uh, you know, before the country was found, it was called Rome. And the Capitol building is identically based off of the, uh, off of the Vatican dome, Dumas. And uh, so what we've got now is the Holy Roman Empire. And the Holy Roman Empire, go back into history and, look, and ask the question in history. Go back to the re uh, reference books on the Roman Empire and find out where did Caesar rule Rome from. Caesar was emperor of Rome, and Rome dominated all of Europe. Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Caesar dominated Rome, and Rome dominated Europe. And so, therefore, where did Caesar rule Rome from? He ruled Rome from, there was, uh, Rome is called the city of seven hills. And he ruled Rome from something called Capitoline Hill, which was actually Capitol Hill. That's in Roman history. So Caesar ruled the empire from Capitol Hill. And it was said in history books that where Caesar each morning, quote, the reference book says, quote, he would go up on the hill, end quote, to officiate as Caesar before the Roman Senate. So therefore, Rome had a Senate. Where? Up on the hill. What hill? Capitol Hill. <clears throat> Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. And so today, we still have Caesar, who believes himself to be God, incarnated Jehovah. He is absolute God over the entire Roman Empire. So All people must come and bow down to Caesar, bow down and, and sprinkle incense on the altar of Caesar because he represents Jehovah God. He represents the almighty God of the universe. He is the emperor of the world. I'm just saying that today the president of the United States is considered to be the emperor of the universe. All people should bow down and sing praises to him and sing all kind and beat themselves on sackcloth and ashes and be aware that he represents God. He is the absolute authority over everything. So all of this nonsense about America being the land of the free and the home of the brave, that went out in 1871. It's gone. From here on out, you're under the Roman dictatorship out of Vatican Rome, and that's why today when the Pope comes here to America, 
you see George Bush running out and kissing the ring, all the politicians, left and right wing politicians, communists, Nazis, fascists, doesn't matter who they are, they all run out and kiss the Pope's ring because America is the new Rome. I just looked it up and Ulysses S. Grant was president in 1871. Oh, there you go. So what is going on here today is not against the Constitution. It's not against the Declaration of Independence. It's not against the law. If you go to work at Sears or General Motors or any corporation, they tell you when you can go to work. You you show up here at 7 o'clock, not 7.10, 7 o'clock. You take a break at 10 o'clock. You take another break at 3, and you're not asking questions. We're telling you. And here's what you're going to do. Here's, what, here's the job you're going to be assigned to. Now, do you want the job or don't you? If you don't like it, that's all right. Hit the street. We'll get somebody who does want it. So the point being is that what General Motors is doing to you, telling you when you can come in, when you can go home, when you can take a break, you ask permission if you want to go to the bathroom, if you want to take a break, you ask permission. You don't just pick, get up and walk off the job. So the point being is that they own you for that eight hours or nine hours you're at work. They own you. You live by their rules. As long as you're inside that corporation working, they're the boss, not you. So, therefore, if you say you're a U.S. citizen, you are, in fact, an employee of a foreign corporation that was in Washington, D.C., and therefore, you, it is not unlawful what they're doing. It's not illegal what they're doing. You are an employee. It's a very clever manipulation of an exploitation and a manipulation of a circumstance that happened because of the Civil War. After the Civil War, here's what I am told by people who know. I am not an authority on this subject. I have said over and over I'm not an authority on any subject. Uh, what I bring to the table is the fact that I've been in the company of extraordinarily brilliant people for the last 40 years or 45 years of my life, I've been in the company of incredibly intelligent people doing extraordinarily brilliant things. And I've listened to the teachers. I've listened to Jesuit scholars, to <clears throat> politicians, to, to statesmen, to royalty of Europe. I've been in the company of um, impressive people and just listening. I'm not the authority on anything. I'm just telling you what I've heard from e e experts. When you understand that there's a world of difference between the United States of America that was founded in 1776 as a republic, as opposed to after the republic was destroyed, there was a civil war where one half of this country was killing the other half. Well, you got to understand, if you found out that Sears had a riot in Sears and one half the employees killed the other half, that's very serious. That's bloodshed. So you got to realize Sears is never going to be the same again. There ain't never going to be the same Sears we all knew and loved. It's gone. Because after that kind of a riotous bloodshed, the whole thing is going to have to be changed. We've got a whole new system of operation now because the, the old system, the old company is gone. We've got a whole new system. Why? Because the people were killing people. So the original United States of America is gone. It's over. Therefore, to say that you have, go into court and you say, well, I have certain protections. I have the Bill of Rights and I have the Constitution. There is no such a thing as a United States Constitution for a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizen means employee of a privately owned company Established in 1871, okay? Employee of a privately owned company established 1871. Therefore, you are not an American national. You are a U.S. citizen. And when you go to the, to the post office to, to get the paperwork for a, a, a passport, there are two papers that you can fill out. One is white and one's green. And on the green one, uh, I am told by attorneys that on the green one they've showed me that it says if you are, are applying for a passport, but you don't want to continue to be a member of the corporation, you want to separate yourself from the United States Corporation, incorporated in 1871, 
then you need to get you need to sign this green paper and then you will get a passport for an American national, not a US citizen. And I've seen the passports. There's a blue which most people carry, which is the US citizen, yeah. and then there's the uh American passport, which is green. And that's actually a lot of diplomats carry the green passport. That's right. Because it's a world of difference between being a U.S. citizen and being an American national. American national, you know, as a matter of fact, my friend Joe is a brilliant mind, government, and law. is extraordinarily brilliant guy. But he was showing me letters where uh, he was dealing with the internal revenue. And... Uh, and he showed me the letters where the Internal Revenue said, I'm paraphrasing what, what, what was in the letters. He, basically, they said to him, the Internal Revenue said to Joe, if you're going to deal with the corporation called United States Corporation, then you deal directly with us, the, the, the Internal Revenue and the, and the Federal Reserve. But if you're going to deal with the state of California as a California state citizen, then you're dealing with the Republic which is in, founded in 1776, which has nothing to do with us at all. So if that's what you're doing as a state citizen, you are talking to us about taxes, you're talking to the wrong people. We don't have any jurisdiction over you. You need to, go, you need to talk to the government of the United States of America, which is in Philadelphia. Here's their phone number, here's their address, and here's where the United States of America's government actually is in Philadelphia. But if you want to deal with us as a privately owned corporation called United States, now we are in Washington, D.C. It's called the Internal Revenue. Internal Revenue, why? Because the corporation is like General Motors. And anyone who works at General Motors, Ford Motor Company, or any big corporation, anybody working inside that corporation is internal internal. So General Motors does not have anything to do with people outside who work for Baskin Robbins. They don't have any control over anybody except in their General Motors. They have control over. Therefore, the, the corporation called United States only has jurisdiction over those people who are their employees. That's why they have an internal revenue service. Not external for everybody. No, no, not everybody. Just those people who work for the corporation are come under internal revenue. Which in this case is almost everybody. It's just about everybody. Internal revenue, which means just about everybody is a member of a corporation. That's right. And therefore, the corporation is perfectly right in telling you what you can do and what you can't do. And they said, you can't have a house without coming to me and asking permission. Don't, don't you see there's a difference between the Statue of Liberty? You see in New York a thing called Statue of Liberty? What do you think that means, son? You better go back to school. That's not the Statue of Freedom for America. That was given to the corporation, United States Corporation. It was given to the corporation. It's called the Statue of Liberty, not the Statue of Freedom. Statue of Liberty, the word liberty in a law book means you ask permission. If you want to take the car and borrow my car, you ask permission. You don't have liberty to just walk in and take somebody's property. You ask permission. And if I say no, that means you can't borrow. So, therefore, you ask permission. Then if I say yes, I'm giving you liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he comes in off the ship at sea. He comes into a harbor. He asks permission of the captain to let him go for two days and have drinking and partying, right? If the captain says no, then you're not going anywhere. Why? Because the captain is the boss. And if he says no, you go nowhere. Why? Simple. When you're in the Navy... You are his property. You do not have freedom. You get liberty. You ask permission, and if your father says so, you can go. And when he tells you to be back at 10 o'clock, he didn't say 1030. You show up 10 minutes late, and you're in the brig. You're going to jail. Because the old man said 10 o'clock, and you showed up at 1030 drinking, you're going to jail. Because he gave you liberty up to 10 o'clock. He didn't give you liberty to 1030. He didn't give you freedom. He didn't give you freedom. He gave you liberty. You asked permission. That's what the statue is called, the Statue of Liberty, meaning you ask the corporation. You have to have a, you have to have a permit. You've got to have a license. 
you got to ask permission. You have to have this and that. You know, you can't just go out and build a house without permission. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, well, that's under the well, that's under the United States of America. But you see, they change the word state. They change the word liberty. They change the word freedom. They've changed everything under the new administration in 1871. Well, the question I have for you, and maybe we can close in this for another subject, is. U.S. citizens, can they become American citizens? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And I just looked it up. The Statue of Liberty was given to America in 1886, <clears throat> five years before they decided to start this uh, corporation. Oh, Interesting. So uh, one more question. The United States was a privately held company. Yeah. You know, still is. Is. It, is it still? Still is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, still is a privately owned company. Not yeah. the United States of America. Not the 50 states collectively. The 50 states collectively, that's the republic. The United States that, of America republic. Which was 1776. No. No, they're I'm still, talking about— They're still in the republic. Okay, the United States Corporation, oh, which yeah, that's, we are all pretty much all of. employees of, citizens right. of, that is still a privately held corporation. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Is there records— well, of course there's records. Where are they? How will we find that out? Google. Google, I doubt it. It's all Google. out there. It's on Google. Come on. Look at all you have to do is go on the web and type in. Now, just listen to the words I'm using. Write down the words I'm using and uh, start it with, look at, I, I'm not putting myself out there on, on the air talking about BS. Go on the web and type in this. Write this down and listen to what I'm saying. Go on the web and type in U.S., then V.S., Victory Service, V.S., Victory and Service, or V.S., okay? U.S., V.S., U.S.A. So it's United States versus the United States oh. of America, U.S. versus here. U.S.A. Here it is right here. In yeah. 1871, Congress did expressly incorporate the District of Columbia, but District of Columbia and the United States are not one and the same. That's right. As in Act of <clears throat> 1871, Congress also expressed, extended the United States con Constitution into District of Columbia. Actually, if you want to Google... But you'll see there's two different constitutions. Correct. There's a Constitution of the United States... And there's a Constitution for the United States. The Constitution of the United States of America or the Constitution for the United States. One is of the United States of America and the other is for the United States. Of and for are two different words. Two different constitutions. They read almost identically the same, but there's been a couple of little words changed in one. The corporation has changed a few words, but that's all right. It's okay to do that because nobody reads anyway. Since nobody reads anyway and no one has any idea what I'm talking about, that's okay because nobody's going to say anything because it has nothing to do with anything of any real importance like, like uh, Paris Hilton, Hilton being laid or basketball or, or, or tennis or sports or anything you know, that's important to the American people. Now, who owns you and your baby and your child? Who owns you and who can put you into prison and who can take your life? That's unimportant. What's, what's important to Americans is basketball, it's sports, it's, the, you know, it's, 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 it's entertainment. Things like who owns your body and who owns your, your, your person and who owns you, Americans couldn't care less. As long as they got well, plenty of beer and a lot, a lot of alcohol, because we do happily, thank God, at least in America, we got a liquor store on every corner. Why? To make sure everybody's got plenty of liquor, get liquored up, have all the beer and party all you want, and have a lot of fun watching TV, go to your frat parties and sex and drugs and rock and roll and drugs. And that's what you do when you're going to rape somebody. The best thing to do if you're going to rape a girl is get her drunk, right? If you're going to, if you're going to make a, a, a hit on, on, the, on her, get her drinking first, right? So the, it would follow that if you're going to rape a nation, get them on drugs. 
so that eventually one day 80% of the whole country will be so drugged out and the rest are all drunk on alcohol. Nobody's going to know anything about nothing. Nobody can read. Nobody understands what's going on. You got it made. Just go in there and rip them off. In life, there's two fucks, fuckies and fuck ors. <laughs> hey, it's just business. Yeah, yeah let's go have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why do you have to go to court to start with? I mean, what's the whole idea of going to court? Why? It's because you play basketball on the court. You play tennis on a court. And when the king has dominion of power around his castle, is called the courtyard. When you're dating a girl, you're courting her. So basketball, tennis on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? You play with a racket. You think all these words are just by chance? You need to understand. Now, I told you what understand means, where it comes from. You're standing under the subject you're building on. That's how you get understanding, is to stand under the subject. So don't just look at the surface of things. Do some homework and go down underneath where nobody's looking and get the real law and go back to the original and find out where this stuff really comes from. Now, I would suggest, if you're interested in this subject, as I said before in the other program, go to the web and type in U.S. V.S. U.S.A. It's not my website. I didn't write anything on it. None of it's on my website. But I just found it to be extraordinarily interesting and incredibly important information right there in your face. Nobody sees it. It's called U.S. V-S-U-S-A. Also, while you're at it, go on the web and type in commerce game. Very simple, commerce game. And then also, while you're at it, well, since you're doing some reading and studying now for the first time in your life, you're actually waking up and actually putting something in your brain besides uh, Paris Hilton getting laid or the basketball score, since you're now actually doing something intelligent like reading a book and understanding where your government comes from and why you're going to prison, uh, it's because somebody owns you. And once you understand that, things are going to get a lot more clearer for you. Now, we go back to the subject of the corporation. Uh, you know, the, my God, there's so much we could talk about in relation to this, but I'm not going to spend much more time on this because um, it's all out there on the web. Also, what I was going to say, go on the web to uh, video. Go out there and was it YouTube and all the different video services on the web and type in commerce game. And there must be a thousand hours of brilliant people, extraordinarily bright people in law and international law, maritime admiralty law, explaining to you, sit and watch them. Just sit and watch and listen to the lectures on, on YouTube under commerce game. They will explain to you how the corporation works, who founded it, who owns the corporation, how it works, as opposed to the United States of America, who founded that and how that was founded, and the difference between being an American as opposed to being a U.S. citizen. Americans have access. This is what the U.S. government, the corporation, will tell you. If you write them, they will tell you, as an American national, you have access to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. You are covered under the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence. Therefore, you are protected under the Bill of Rights and under the U.S. Constitution and under the, uh, the Declaration of Independence. They will tell you that. You are protected. So if you are an American national, when you go into court, there are certain things they can't do to you because you're an American. You're a free, you're a free man. You have certain rights and privileges that a U.S. citizen don't have because you're not a, a member. That's the same thing as if you work for Baskin Robbins or for, or for some uh, store and you go into Sears. Sears can't do anything to you. You, <clears throat> you don't work for them. You're not their employee. They don't have any jurisdiction over you. They can't tell you when to come in and when to leave. Why? Because you work for a different company. 
They don't have any control over you, no jurisdiction over you, only their own employees. That's why if you're a U.S. citizen, they have direct control over you because you are their employee. Now, if you are their employee of the corporation, let me give you an example like, uh, let's say, Ford Motor Company. I use a big corporation because the U.S. is a big corporation, okay? So if you're working for, say, Ford Motor Company, well, Ford Motor Company, my God, it must be in 50 different countries. There's a Ford Motor Company in India. But if you work for Ford Motor Company in any country in the world, you're still an employee of Ford Motor Company. It doesn't matter what nation or what country you live in, you are still a member of Ford Motor Company. Therefore, you are under Ford Motor Company's laws, regulations. And if you do your job, which they needed somebody to do the job you were hired to do, and if you do your job, Ford Motor Company feels very secure that you are doing your job and taking care of your responsibility. They feel better about things because you're doing your job. Therefore, you are considered a security for them because they had a problem, they had an opening that they needed some help. You came in and became their employee. Now they feel secure that their, that their job is being done. Therefore, a whole association, all the people working for Ford anywhere in the world, collectively, are called in law. It's a, it's a collective body of people who work for Ford Motor Company, all, all nations and languages. They are referred to in law as the body social. The body social is a word in law meaning everyone who works for Ford. I don't care if they're in Afghanistan or, or in L.A., doesn't matter. If they're working for Ford, they're part of the body of Ford. It's called in law the body social. And as long as you're doing your job, then you are a security for the body social which means they're making money now, and they're doing real well. As long as you do your job and make sure you do your job well, they're making money, and they're paying you, and you, what are you happy? What do you got to say? They're paying you, and you're doing real well. They're buying your beer and paying your bills. So you are a security for the body social. That's why when you, when you retire, which means at 5 o'clock you go home, you're retiring from, so you walk out in the street. Now you're not under their jurisdiction anymore until you go back the next morning. So therefore, if you do your job well, you are security for the body social. So when you retire, you get social security. Why social security? Because they have made money off of you. So they're giving you a little dividend. They keep you quiet, keep you happy. They appreciate what you did. So they give you a few bucks to go live and get out of here. Go home and we'll send you a check every month. So you get something called social security. Why? Because your body is a security for the Ford Motor Company body social. For the whole social organization called Ford, your body was a security for it. So you get social security. It's not that they're giving you anything. You were a security. Now it goes into there's another reason why it's called social security, because your physical body, your flesh and blood body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. Your flesh and blood body is also a security around the world on the different stock exchanges of the world. You don't know that, but your body is a security on the banking corporations of the world. If you go back and get your birth certificate, which remember, a birth certificate, your mother gave birth to you. She was in labor. So when she gave birth to you, the corporation took your body. They own your body. And your mother and father sign where it says, it doesn't say parent, it says informant. And then look where the security, it's on bank security paper. All birth certificates are on bank security paper. It's the same kind of paper, the same design laid uh, out. Stock or bond. Uh, any stock and bonds, of course. Well, any stock or bonds. Where is the significance with the... Uh Common stock, preferred stock, where the common man versus the preferred man. Of course, of course. That's why I said if, you, if your daughter's getting married and she's marrying into the Rockefeller family, we say, well, boy, he's of good stock. What do you mean? She's marrying a cow? No, no, it's good because humans are considered to be stock in the corporation. So he's of good stock or she's of good stock. 
So your body, your physical body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. You are considered stock. Are all our stocks the, worth the same amount of money? Yeah, I, all the stocks are worth the same amount of money. And I'm not sure exactly how that's figured. I know who does the figuring. I know basically, and there's a lot of information already out there. All you got to do is go on the web and type in birth certificate stock market, birth certificate stock market. And all kinds of stuff will come up explaining well, how the stock market works, what your birth certificate is, how you, your physical body, flesh and blood body, are a security on the New York Stock Exchange and that you are being bought and sold all around the world. Your body is. Well, that's what the, you look at the back of the Social Security number. There's usually a number. That's right. A and series they, and, of numbers. And there's some theories that say that that number is uh, actually uh, an ISIN number, which is a security or bond that's tracked around the globe. That's right. And that's why it's on the dollar bill. I mean, you look on any American bills, any bank notes, and you will see the same numbers. The serial numbers on bank notes in, in America are the same serial numbers on the back of Social Security card. Take your Social Security card and line up the number on the back with the numbers on the American bills, and you'll see they're all the same numbers. It's because your body is a security for the Federal Reserve that prints the money. You are the security well, for the Federal Reserve. Yeah, and that's where it went into the Department of Human Resources and Social yeah, Security Administration. And I think part of that goes back into 33 when uh, the U.S. government was re rebuilt with all these new departments after right. we were you know, bankrupt after the Great Depression. That's right. Bankrupt after the Great Depression and, uh, and had to refinance the whole corporation and the corporation needed money. Go back to 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. Of that course. was put into place. There's all correlations between World War One, World War Two, and where we're at today. Where can I see that? Is you it just possible? go on the web and go to stock market birth certificate, and go also to video YouTube, and listen to the experts. I'm not the expert. I'm just telling you go to listen to the experts. They'll explain it all to you. And just go on the web to uh, YouTube and type in stock market birth certificate, or birth certificate stock market. And then listen to all the all the experts. They were giving lectures on the subject of how it works, why it works the way it does, and all that. It's all been out there for years. Nobody reads. And the reason why most people have never heard this is because it's basically the reason why most people are not aware of this kind of knowledge is very understandable. It's very reasonable. It don't have anything to do with basketball or sex or Paris Hilton or Big Top Pee Wee, or Bugs Bunny, or, or the sitcoms, and Two and a Half Men, and all this other silly nonsense that Hollywood gives to children. They give, you know, that's when I was a kid. Now, today, even when, when, when adults get together, they always tell the kids, go out and play ball. Why? Because the men after dinner want to talk man talk. The women are going to be in the kitchen talking women talk. And men don't have any place in there, so just stay out of the kitchen because you know you don't want to hear it anyway. The women have their own thing, and the men are going to be sitting in the front room with the cigars and the wine, and they're going to be talking business and talking stuff, right? And we don't want children sitting here hearing what we're, ta what we're well, talking about. Here. So, so you tell the kids go out and play ball. Well, here's how to find it. If you Google it, it'll state that first date the year that you were born. So if you were born in 1967. You forward slash, and then you put in the letter D for delta or date, and then you obviously all uppercase, and then you'll type in that number. And that's how you can check it, and you can go to different sites. One of the sites here is showing, go to fidelity.com. That's a great way to check a stock symbol and whatnot. If you back up, go to fidelity.com, type in the year that you were born, forward slash, delta, and then the numbers, and that should show when you were born. The numbers on? The numbers on the back of your birth certificate okay, or Social Security card. And Social Security card. Are they the same number? Uh, no, no. They're different. different. They're different They're all different. They're all different. But I'm just saying, look at, let me, let me state again. I'm not the world's foremost expert on any of this. What I bring to the table, if anything of any value, is the people that I have been in the company of. I have been blessed with the ability to be in the company of extraordinary people who know extraordinary things. 
about law, about government, about religion, about ancient history, about the occult world, uh, dealing with, with occult religions, occult symbols, uh, the dark world, and uh, the I, I, I don't know what else to call it, the dark world, the world of the occult. The hidden world. The hidden world. The hidden world of how finance really works. Uh, how banks actually work. Banks do not work the way you think they do. There is a law in this country, in America, from day one, there's been a law in this country that says, and most people have never heard such a thing, but it's true. There is a law in this country that says no banks can loan money ever, period. There is no such a thing as a bank loaning money ever. Because logic alone would tell you that. You don't have to be a scientist to figure it out. If I bring in $100,000 and put my into the bank to save my money, and you come in with, with $50,000 to save your money, then he comes in uh, two weeks later and borrows 150000 for the airplane he wants to buy. What, he's going to give you my money and your money to buy his airplane? You must be out of your mind. I didn't put my money in there for him to buy his airplane. I'll put my money in there to save my money, not to give it to him. So And so, therefore, you can't give my money away. So when you wrote out a check at the bank and gave him $150,000 for his plane, where'd that money come from? You didn't use my money, did you? Because my friend went with me, he put 50000 bucks in, and he wants to know where his money is, too. So where did you get the money, the 150000 to buy his airplane? Oh, that's a whole different story. That's a whole different story where banks get their money. Banks are not allowed by law to loan money. So don't tell me that you borrowed the money from the bank to buy a new car or to buy your home. You didn't borrow a nickel, period. That's the law. Now, how did you get it? Well, that's a whole different story. But what you need to understand, you never, ever have or ever will have an opportunity to borrow money from a bank. It don't happen. That's the law. Banks cannot loan money. Okay? So move on. And let's talk about something else. <laughs> That's the law. You cannot loan money. You cannot loan somebody else's money. Logic alone would tell you that. They're lending you your own money. That's ah, right. Okay, okay. I was going to ask. <laughs> let me explain. Okay, let me let me give it to you very quickly. Again, I'm not the world's foremost authority on the internet. Okay. But here's what the experts I've sat with people who are international bankers, and I could give you their names. They're very impressive people. And I just sit and listen because I don't know from nothing, but I'm listening to the guys who know. And they're saying when you walk into a bank to buy, a, say, a $50,000 new car, First of all, that new car must be appraised by a state approver appraiser. That's number one. The bank will not finance anything that's not been appraised, so it has to be appraised. Why? Because the state has given you authority as an appraiser to tell me how much is that car worth. Whatever you say it's worth, that's what it's worth. And the state doesn't care. What did the appraiser say? He said it's worth 50000 That's it. It's worth 50000 Why? Because he's a state. He represents a state. And he said it's worth fifty. So that's what it is right on the paper. That's 50000 If he's wrong, we'll deal with him later. But right now, for the, for the so-called buying of that car, whatever he says it is, that's what it is. Okay. So now it's been appraised at $50,000. So now that paperwork on that car is now called commercial paper. Because that paperwork represents $50,000 in business. Because $50,000 is going to change hands here. A $50,000 worth of car is going to go from his hand, who owned the car, at the dealer, to the new guy who's going to buy it. $50,000 just passed under my table. It just passed my table. So now the paperwork is, it represents $50,000 in business. Now, if you want to buy the car and they look at you and, and, and look at your back record, and if, uh, can you pay and do you pay your bills, right? Okay, then the auto agency takes the paperwork and they fill out all the paperwork on the car and they give that to you and you take it to the bank or they'll mail it to the bank. 
Now, the bank looks at it, and it's been appraised at $50,000, so they know it's worth fifty. And the paperwork shows who, uh, what color it is and how much it weighs and all the information on the car. And then they look at you. Do, do you look like a guy who can pay your bills and will pay your bills? Yeah, okay. So then what we will do is we will take this $50,000 paperwork, which is called commercial paper, and any bank realizes that this is $50,000 we're talking about here in paperwork. They open up a bank account in your name. And they will forge your name because you can't open a bank account without somebody's signature. So they will open a bank account in your name. They put your name on the bank account and they will write your name in and write it as if it was your name. So now they've opened up a bank account for you at that bank because you've got a good credit. So they open up a bank account and they take the $50,000 worth of commercial paper and put it in the bank account. Now, according to them, you got fifty thousand dollars in your bank account. <laughs> they're holding, they're holding the paperwork for the ownership of that fifty thousand, but it's in your your bank account. So they are saying you got fifty thousand dollars in your bank account. Now, what you want to do with it? Well, I'd like to buy the car, Airhead. That's why I came over here. Okay. So since you have fifty thousand dollars with us, because we own the pink slip, not you. We own the car, and the car is worth fifty thousand. So since it's worth 50000 and you want the car, we, will, as we opened up a bank account for you. Now we will sign a check on your bank account for you that gives you the $50,000 for the car. And you give it to you. It's not to you. It's to the auto agency. So now the auto agency gets the $50,000. they are happy. They sold the car. You're happy. You got a car. The bank's happy because they just did $50,000 worth, worth of business. They're happy. Everybody's happy. Come on. Paul, they help me out here. <laughs> so everybody's happy. Now, when you pay, when you pay your first payments, all of that goes to interest. Why? It's because they never paid you anything. They took the fifty thousand uh, dollar appraisal paperwork, commercial paperwork that represented fifty thousand, put it into a bank account, then wrote you a check on your bank account that you gave to the car agency. So when did they give you my money or his money? They didn't give you nothing. You gave them $50,000. Of course, you borrowed it from the, from the, from the auto agency. So they actually put up the $50,000 for you. They gave you a $50,000 car. So they gave me $50,000 before credit. I credit. got the car. That's <laughs> right. Okay. So, But it's a credit. They didn't give you my money. They gave you, they wrote a check on the commercial paper, which represented the $50,000 in business. They gave you a check on that paperwork. Because if you don't pay it back, the auto agency doesn't care. They don't care if you don't pay it. They got paid. They don't care. That's your problem with the bank if you don't pay it. And the bank doesn't care because they got your pink slip. So if you don't want to pay it, fine, we'll just take the car. It's ours. We got the pink slip. We own it. You signed it over to us. And, you know, so if you don't pay for the car, that's no problem. We'll just take the car because we can always hand it back and sell it for 50000 So besides, we didn't pay you anything. So if we sold the damn car for 20000 we made 20000 more than what we were expecting because we didn't pay you nothing anyway. They don't give you a loan. No, they're using they your own lo money. They they loan you money, but they loan you your own money. That's right. They loan you. They don't loan you nothing. Oh, you also we forgot the part that they'll also do that, and then with the fractional reserve, <laughs> they give you sixteen times whatever was on deposit. Like if it's your fifty thousand dollar check that you borrowed, they took that asset and then enhanced it with. Well, they take the if it's fifty thousand. They would take it sixteen times that. And then they reloan that out to others. I mean, it's fractional reserve. It's just one big pyramid. Yeah. It's crazy. But we'll get into that. I think that's a that's that'll be stuff. another uh, series in itself, where we can get into some of that with, uh, you know, sort of how the whole banking system works. So therefore, the way it works is that your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. You're worth about six million dollars on the New York Stock Exchange that you don't know anything about. 
and it's not important for you to know anything about it. You just go on out to the ball game and drink your beer and play basketball and do whatever the silly ass thing you do that you call yourself doing, <clears throat> and you let your masters who own the country and the masters who own the world, let them take care of all the business. You're just a kid. You'd be a team player. You're just going out and play ball. And one day you're going to wake up and find out how this world really runs. And when you find out that you have been lied to and tricked and deceived and you're not an American, you don't have any freedom, you ain't never had no freedom, and your grandma never had no freedoms. You go back to 1871, son, you ain't never had no freedom. You have the Statue of Liberty. You ask permission. You don't do nothing in this country unless you get permission. You sign the papers. You, you ask permission. You want to paint your house, you better talk to the city hall. You better go down there and get a permit and fill out the paperwork, and maybe, possibly, they will let you. But if they don't let you and you do it anyway without them letting you, you work for the corporation they are ahead, and you built a car, or you built something here on the company property, and you didn't ask the boss for permission. Go tear it down. Well, I can't tear it down. Then you're going to jail because you work for me. I don't work for you. So you're going to jail for doing something you did not ask permission for because you don't, don't walk around here like some damn fool talking that you got freedom and liberty and justice, American. You ain't got no freedom. You're a U.S. citizen, which means you're an employee of a privately owned company, and you're going to jail because you didn't ask permission. You talking to me? You talking to the boss. You get a permit from the city. You fill out the paperwork and you get a permit. You get a license. That's why when you get married, you get married, you have to have a license to get married. Why? Because marriage is considered, by the international maritime law, marriage is considered a company. So when I see you with the girl, I say, you know what? She's bad company. And you say, mind your own business. Because you get married and she's going to be your partner. What are you talking about? Business, uh, marriage, partner, uh, company. She's bad company. Mind your own business. She's going to be your partner, business, company, partner. You're talking business here. So if you're talking business, you're going to have to have a license to, practice, to, to, to take care of business. It's called a business license. Why? Because your body is considered a corporation. Your body is considered a corporation. When you die, you are referred to as a corpse because your body is a corporation. So when one corporation is getting ready to do business with another corporation, she's a corporation. And when she dies, she's a corpse. And when you die, you're a corpse because you're a corporation. And therefore, she's a corporation and you're a corporation. Two corporations are getting ready to come together and, and do some business. So they're going to be partners, right? So if you're going to be a partner in business, you first of all better get all this straight with the government first. Because if you're General Motors and, you're, uh, and you are Toyota, and General Motors is going to do some business with Toyota, that's perfectly fine. It's just business, nothing personal, just business. But if you're going to do that, you better get your lawyers and talk with these lawyers and better talk with the federal government's lawyers to see how you're going to do this. Who's going to pay the taxes? Who's going to pay the insurance? And uh, is all of this perfectly lawful and legal in the corporation? Because if we find you two guys are doing business behind the scenes that you didn't tell us about, you both go into jail. Why? Because you are under our jurisdiction, United States Corporation. So if you want to do business with her, that's fine. Get a license because she's a corporation, you're a corporation, and you're getting ready to do some business. And if your business don't work out, you're not going to God. You're going to court. You better bring your money and your house and your car and anything you may have manufactured. <laughs> you bring your children, and it's going to be dirty when we end the court. You're going to find out who owns that child, and you're going to find out the state owns that child. Why? Because they are the ones that gave you the permission to do the business. You got a permit from the state. It's called a license. So the person who gives you a license is the ultimate authority. So if the state of California gave you a license to get married, 
that's a piece of business. Therefore, any product coming from that business, the state owns that property because they're the ones that gave you the permission to do any work at all. So she was in the delivery room delivering you in labor. She was in labor delivering you, the product, to the corporation called United States Corporation, who the father manufactured. Understand the way international business works. We humans are security on the stock exchange. We came out of our mother's water. We're maritime admiralty products. This is why you have banks. Why do you have a bank? Banks are on both sides of a river. They're called river banks. What does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the currency because your money is, goes like, well, your money is like water. No, money is water. It's called currency. It's a current, an ebb and flow. comes in and goes out, an ebb and flow. That's why when you're alive, <clears throat> you have to breathe. You have to breathe in and breathe out. That's normal. All animals and all things living breathe. You breathe out and you breathe in. You breathe it out and you bring it in. Okay, it's called breathing. That's why the Federal Reserve, who prints the money, puts the money out there to be used by the people, then the internal revenue brings some of it back in. Then it prints more money out there, and the internal revenue puts a heavy tax and brings some back in. They have to do that. You can't just keep breathing out. you got to breathe in. But you can't keep breathing in. you got to breathe out to breathe in. So the same idea is that you put out the money, but then you got to bring it back in. And put it back out and then bring it back in. It's the ebb and flow of life. You know, like the movie uh, uh, Network. Life, uh, uh, the world is a business, Mr. Veal. It's all, com it's all it's commerce. It's all commerce. We're talking money here. So if we want to get married, we're talking money. It's business. And whatever you produce, you call it a baby. We don't care what you call it. It belongs to the state that gave you the permit. Then let me explain this to you also. When you buy a new car, uh, you are referred to as an operator. That's why you get what is called an operator's manual, which tells you how to operate the car, when to change the oil, what to do, what not to do. Operator's manual. However, if you buy the car, a motorcycle, it doesn't matter, the 18 wheeler, you still get an operator's manual. Whatever it is, you're buying a, a motorcycle. It doesn't matter. You get an operator's manual. Why? Because you're considered an operator, okay, of a, of a vehicle. But if you're going to use those wheels, the 16-wheeler or the motorcycle or the car, I don't care what it is you're riding. If it's on wheels, then it's going somewhere. If you're going to use those wheels to make money, now it's business. It's different. If you were just going to buy the motorcycle or ride around town, that's it. That's, that's, that's your business. But if you're going to use it to, as a delivery service, now you're making money with it. So if you're going to use the car and make it into a cab, now that's different. Now you're not an operator. Now that you're using the wheels to make money, we're talking business, which means you've got to have a license, right? So now we call anyone who's doing business with wheels, we call them a driver, not an operator. So in, in, in law, if you're referred to as a driver, that immediately means to anyone hearing it in a court that you're in business. That's why you have a, you have the, uh, a truck driver, a cab driver. You know, you have a bus driver. Driver means business. You're making money driving the bus. You're not operating the bus. No, you're driving the truck. You're a truck driver. It means you're doing business. Therefore, you have to have a license. It's called a driver's license. So today, we are assumed that everybody is doing making money. So what they decided to do is make everybody a corporation. Well, what do corporations do if they don't make money? They're in business. So if you are, your body is a corporation, then you must be in business. What the hell you got a corporation if you're not doing your business? So if you're a corporation, that means you're doing business. Therefore, if you're in a car, you need a driver's license because you're not an operator. 
You're not an operator. You're a driver because you're a corporation, and corporations are always in business to make money. So we just assume that you are making money, and so we call you a driver. Now you have to have a driver's license. You say, well, yeah, but I'm not using my car. It doesn't matter. What the hell's wrong with you? I just said you're a corporation, right? Yes. Well, corporations are business, right? Yeah, that's it. Out of here. You've got to have a driver's license. So if you're an American and national. Oh, that's different. Because if you're American national, now you have nothing to do with the corporation called United States Corporation at all. Now it's totally different. So a big different story now. Now it's a different story. So it's just interesting if you understand what I call occult law. Occult simply means hidden. 